problems. Okay, so this problem is asking you for the equation of the tangent line at this point. So this is a, a curve, right? Y equals X to the fourth. We don't really know exactly what an X to the fourth looks like. You know, it could look something like that, right? Is a sort of generic X to the fourth polynomial. And there's some point, right? And I wanna find the equation of that tangent line. So like, that's what we're doing, you know, graphically or intuitively. And again, that may not be anything like the actual X to the fourth or the actual tangent line, but that's what we're trying to do. And you want to remember that for the equation of any line, what we need is we need a point and we need a slope, right? And then you can find your line, whether you're using Y equals MX plus B, or some of you might, you know, use y minus y1 equals m, x minus x1, right? Either one of those you can use to figure out what the equation actually is. So we have the point, right? We know exactly where we're looking for this line. It has to go through 1, 8. But of course, we don't have the slope, right? That's the part we're missing. Um, luckily, that's what we learn with the derivative, right? So the derivative, this is really just a question, you know, find the derivative. Um, when we have y, we will sometimes write, write the derivative as y prime and we'll sometimes write the derivative as dy dx. Those are the same, same meaning, right? just how we write it, notation. Um, and luckily for us, this is a, a nice polynomial. And so its derivative is going to be straightforward, right? Our derivative rules say I can take the derivative of each of these pieces independently. Right? X to the fourth, that's a power rule. That's what we call that one, 4x cubed. 8x squared, that's also a power rule with a constant in front. And, you know, as you do more of these, you won't really think about the rule, right? You'll just be like, well, this is how you take the derivative. And that's totally fine, right? We don't need to necessarily name those rules or um, if you're comfortable with that, the, the patterns hold. Okay. So, and then the derivative of minus x is minus one. So this derivative, of course, gives me the slope of the tangent line at any point, right? Um, that's what the function does. And that's really the important, um, one of the important um, understandings of the derivative here, right? So I want to take this and evaluate it at x equals one, right? That's where I want to find the slope of the tangent line when x is one. That's four plus 16 minus one equals 19. So now I have my slope and I have my point. I'll probably use this y equals m x plus b. So I can solve for b. Oops, that's not right. The basic addition subtraction always a, a challenge, right, for all of us. Um, 8 minus 19 is minus 11. Um, so b is minus 11, and then I have y equals 19x minus 11. Okay. Um, a couple points here. One, do not put this in as the slope. I will see that occasionally. People take the whole function and put it in as the slope. That's, that's not really what the derivative is doing. This derivative is a, is a function. It's in no way a line or a constant value. It, it changes as do these slopes, right? As I move in different x values, I'm gonna get different slopes for this function. And that's what this formula is telling me. So in order to sort of activate it, to get it to give me the slope, I need to put in an x value, and that's gonna give me a constant number, right? And that's what I need for my slope of any line, right? It has to be it has to be a constant. Otherwise, you're not going to generate a line if the slope changes all around, right? 
Um, yeah, so I th think that's the main, I mean, the finding the equation, the tangent line, the calculus part of that is the derivative, right? And the derivative tells us the slope, but then there is a little algebra part too, right? Of finding the actual line using something you know about lines. Okay, that should, should be pretty complete answer for that one. Um, but that's a good one. That's, that's a, it's like a good, good standard problem. Other, other questions or anything about this one? Sorry, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this one correctly. So when you input a value for the derivative, so like when we put one in for what we got for the derivative, that gives us the m value? That's right. That's right. Of the tangent line. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, you're right to be asking about that. To me, that says you're thinking about it in the right way. Um, sometimes I think students um, think like, well, I, I, oh, I totally get all that. And it's like, no, you, you don't. I can guarantee none of you fully get this right now, right? This is something that you can you kind of get the idea of it or you can do it, but like to really understand it, it's a new, sort of a new way of looking and thinking at a function. So it's going to take some time and some questioning to kind of get it all to sink in. Um, but what you said is exactly right. When I put in the value of x, the output is the m. It is the slope of the tangent line. So, you know, we've written that in the past by sort of saying m f prime of x is equal to m tangent. It's very kind of casual, right? But that's, that's what we're saying, that the derivative is the slope of the tangent line at different x values. And I think, you know, sometimes it's a hard, it's hard sometimes I think to ask questions too, because it's sort of slippery sometimes, right? You're like, I don't, I, something here I don't get, but I, it's hard sometimes to even ask a question about it. So don't, don't be afraid to sort of say, can you just describe that again or, or something along those lines? And I'll, I'll try and use some different words and, um, you know, sometimes pictures and things can help. And sometimes it does, it's just time, right? Sort of biting off a little bit today and mulling on it and then trying again tomorrow. And, and I think just also being open, thinking like, okay, this is there's kind of a big idea there. I can do some of these problems, but I'm, I'm conscious that there's more out there that we're trying to, to kind of process. And it goes, it's a strange thing because it goes in very different speeds for different students. Some students sort of like, lock on to one topic and then we'll struggle with the later one and some students will be reversed they'll like struggle with an earlier one but then later ones will make sense so it's it's um you know it's just i think accept that right just be like okay this one's not clicking for me right away let's just keep talking about it and and making progress on it so Thank um you. oh yeah of course any other questions or comments about about this problem or any of those basic derivative rules? Okay. Well, if something comes up, we can we can jump in later. Um, today, I wanted to talk about three point two. Um, okay. Well, actually, before I get started, let me. I said I had a couple announcements, so let me let me get started with those. Um, excuse me, I just posted um, the key to the take home work number three. Um, I'll be working on kind of grading that hopefully soon. Um, hopefully tomorrow I'll, I'll get a lot of that graded. Um, I'll also be posting um, sort of a um, a grade for your homework for the first section. So I go through the WebAssign and sort of um, 
kind of summarize what you've got or probably out of 20 points and I'll put that into D2L as well again hopefully in the next day or two so that um, you know look for those things that's kind of how that I do the homework is, is kind of collect it all at the end of each of the chapters um, there's also some issues um, so if you've read the schedule you're supposed to be working or sort of getting started downloading um, Maple. Um, I had a student or two have trouble with um, the 2018 Maple has a has sort of a compatibility issue with the new Macintosh operating system. So um, I don't have a, a e well. I'm not able to get access to the to a newer version of Maple, at least not easily. But I think there's a pretty good workaround, um, according to the IT people, with a virtual. Um, they can load it on the computer at school, and then you guys can access that computer sort of virtually, and run the Maple on that computer. So it's like a, you know, virtual desktop or something. So I, they seem to think, and I do too, that that's going to be a pretty easy workaround for that. And they were getting it loaded on the virtual computer. And as soon as they do, hopefully in the next day or so, I'll send out an announcement on D2L and they'll have some instructions there. So for the rest of you, you should, if you have a Windows computer um, or an older or sort of not updated. I'm not sure how many of you have would have that um, Apple computer. Um, you can still use it just as it's posted. But if you're having trouble with a newer Macintosh, or probably even if you have trouble with whatever computer, um, th this will be an alternative way to access Maple. So I haven't used that with students before, but I've used like a virtual desktop, you know, for sort of um, certain applications and it, it works pretty well. So I, I think that's going to be a good solution. I'll let you know when I get some more information about that. Um, so um, I also wanted to mention that. Um, I think that's all, that's all the, the things I had. Um, the, I just, I also do want to warn you that um, next week I have a couple things going on. I'm, I'm um, out of town. Um, I'm hoping to still be able to check in, um, but it's possible I won't be able to. Um, so I'll, I'll still totally be available for questions and, and other things, but if I do run into trouble with the, the, our scheduled Zoom time, I'll definitely let you know um, earlier in the day that I'm, I wouldn't necessarily be available. Again, I'm hoping I will be um, both days, but um, it's possible I'm not. So. Um, if that's the case, um, you know, just let me know if that slows you down or if there's some questions and we can still go over questions. I could still find some other times to meet. Um, so I just, just to, to keep that in your minds. Um, okay. Any questions, concerns? All right. Well, Okay, um, and you know, I, I, just as a little aside, you know, I I'm, do these little sessions. I, th I think they're similar, you know, to what's posted in the lecture capture and the little videos. So I don't necessarily think there's anything um, too new and radical in these little sessions, but it does give me, a, I, I do like answering your questions especially. So that I feel like is something I wanna make sure to continue. I feel like the little lectures are, are probably similar to what you'd be getting online, but um, I like it when you're here and I know that you're, you're doing it, right? So maybe that, that is an improvement. Okay, so 3.2 um, is introducing two new rules for us that are very important called the product and quotient rules. And again, remember in chapter three, we are trying to take derivatives efficiently. Um, and we're trying to um, sort of build new complicated functions from smaller 
individual functions, right? And that's, um, you know, when we saw the rule like this rule, this is not a product or quotient rule, obviously, but f of x plus g of x is f prime of x plus g prime of x. That's, that's where we can take the derivative of a sum by taking each piece individually. That's the same idea is that like I have a new function, complicated, more complicated function that's made up of f plus g. Well, it turns out I can break that down into just the derivative of f plus the derivative of g. So if I know the individual functions, then I know what happens when I look at f plus g, right? So it's um, giving us a tool to break down these other functions, right, in terms of their individual pieces, components, their basic elements. So the same thing, uh, and then we finished class on Tuesday saying, well, we don't have a product rule or a quotient rule yet. And so that's what we're going to introduce. I'm not going to prove these rules here. Um, I do do that in the lecture, and I, I definitely think that's worth looking at um, and going over. But I want to focus here on just making sure you have the, the tools to complete these. So the product rule is written like this, the derivative of a product of two functions. It is not just the derivative of the first times the derivative of the second. It just doesn't work. The algebra, when you do the limits of these, it doesn't work the same way the sum does. You have to do something a little, a little bit more complicated. And what you end up with is you get the derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. Now, the nice thing here is that it's, it's multiplication and addition. So it doesn't actually matter which order you do the things in. You just have to take the derivative of one times the other one and then add the, the reverse of that, right? The derivative of the other one times the, the first one you did. So I'll probably switch back and forth um, and it, it won't matter at all which order you take those in. So for us, um, that's going to allow us, oops, let's not do that one, x times e to the x. This is a function we weren't able to do at the end of class on Tuesday because it's an exponential combined with a, a polynomial. excuse me, um, and they're not, you can't combine those. You can't use algebra to rewrite this. You're really stuck with this as a product. Well, the product rule tells us how to do that. I know the derivatives of both of these individually, so I can use the product rule. I'm going to take the derivative of the first, which is 1, times the second, e to the x, and then I'm going to take the derivative of the second one. The derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. And I'm going to multiply that by the first. Okay. So like this is, you know, this is a different f than, than in my formula here, right? This function is going here and there, and this function is going there and there. Right? The derivative here, the original function there. And I do want to get in the habit of factoring my answers when it's possible. I can pull e to the x out of both of those. Now, you know, we haven't even met in person, right? So maybe, maybe you find me not very trustworthy yet, right? Like, okay. So this guy is saying this thing, how do I, what doesn't, why, like, why, why would it be this, right? Or um, that'd probably be a good way of thinking, right? Maybe some of you are like, well, I just believe whatever my math teacher tells me. Yeah, that's okay. I wouldn't trust everything, right? You, you want to, you want to sort of think or question a little bit. So I, I do give you a proof of this if you look in the lecture capture, but I can show you at least uh, it, it will feel a little bit convincing. What if f of x is equal to x squared times, say, x to the fourth? 
Well, on one hand, you certainly know from algebra that that's equal to x to the sixth, right? You add those exponents together. And we know that when we take the derivative of x to the sixth, we get 6x to the fifth. So assuming, assuming the things we learned before were true, which they are, um, the derivative should be 6x to the fifth. If, I should do this in red because this is what you don't want to do. If you tried to just sort of use or make up what you do with the product, you might say, well, I'm just going to take the derivative of the first, which is 2x, and I'm going to multiply that by the derivative of the second, which is 4x cubed, and I feel like that should probably be the derivative. Right? But you can see that that's clearly not what we got here, right? This is going to be 8x to the fourth, which does not equal 6x to the fifth. So that this sort of individual derivatives clearly is not working, right, if it's a product. So let's try the product rule and see if this thing at least does what we know it, it should do. So the product rule says I'm going to take the derivative of the first and then I multiply it by the second. And then I add to that the derivative of the second times the first. Okay, that's, that's the product rule. 2x times x to the fourth is 2x to the fifth. Plus 4x to the fifth. And yes, that is giving me what we knew was the correct answer. Now, obviously, well, I don't know about obvious or not, but it is better for this problem to, to do this, right? It's certainly easier to simplify it and just do the derivative directly um, than to go through this product rule process, but they do match up in case you did one or the other, you'll get the same answer in the end. Um, here's another kind of similar example that sometimes people Let's look at five. Um, five x to the fourth. So occasionally people will look for the derivative here and they will say, well, okay, I'm going to take the derivative of five, which I know is zero, and then the derivative of x to the fourth, which is four x cubed, and that's going to be zero. And, you know, I can't hear you screaming no, but I'm, I'm hoping that's what's happening, right? That's not what we do because we do not take the derivative of a product separately. If we have a product, we have to use the product rule. So, again, we have a different way of attacking this one, right? We already actually know what this derivative is because we can do it without the product rule because this is a constant, right? A constant multiple is its own little subset. The constant multiple here, the derivative is gonna be five times four x cubed, which is 20 x cubed. Okay, so we know that derivative from 3.1, um, but you could look at this as five times x to the fourth. That would be also true. And so if you wanted to, Again, not a, not a great idea, but, a, but possible. You can take the derivative using the product rule. So the derivative of five is zero times x to the fourth plus the derivative of x to the fourth times five. So that does go to zero, but we also get this part, which is 20 x cubed and that, of course, is what we know, assuming we believe our previous work, which we should, um, is the derivative. So that's another example where you could use the product rule, but it's not actually what you should do, right? We already have a constant multiple rule. That's a better option. It's going to be faster and easier 
to avoid the product rule. But there are many cases where we, we just can't, right? Or we, we have to do it some other way. And again, this, this comes down to the same idea that I talked about with that early constant exponential example. It's how you see the problem determines what rules you use. So um, if you see the problem one way, you can get there um, with the product rule, but there is often a, a better way of looking at it. Any, any questions? So, Um, it is, I missed that a while ago, but yes, I, I, there's something satisfying about it being real time. I don't know. Even though I don't really see many of your faces or anything, that's still, I, I can sense you, right? Um, okay. So that's the product rule. It becomes um, more important for us as we add other types of functions to the mix. Um, in the beginning here, we don't have a lot of functions to work with. We really have polynomials and then this e to the x function, and that's kind of it. We're going to add some trig functions and log functions. Um, and, you know, the idea here is that, like, this is a product rule, but you don't need the product rule again, right? This is one that's really better to simplify first. And then you can use the, the standard rules from 3.1. So the, the product rule again becomes more important as we get other functions that don't mix well together, right? So um, polynomials mix well together. It's easy to simplify them and combine them. Um, exponentials all mix well together, but exponentials and polynomials, they don't, they don't get to get, they don't get along. There's not real ways of simplifying them, right? Same with trig functions and polynomials. They don't, they don't work together. So those, we're going to have to use the product rule when we see those together. Okay. Um, so yeah, this one, right, we don't, we don't need the prior rule there to do that derivative. Uh, the quotient rule is, is easier to set up some problems that, you know, force us to use the quotient rule. Um, let me write it out for you. The derivative of a quotient, f of x over g of x. Um, is g of x times f prime of x minus f of x times g prime of x all over g of x squared. Um, it's messier than the, the, the product rule. It's got this g of x squared business on the bottom. The top sort of looks similar, except it's got subtraction here. And that's kind of a pain because subtraction means the order really matters. So you got to get the right pair of derivative and function to start with, or else right, you won't get the right answer. Um, I will give you the. I, I, this is my standard, I, the way I remember it. Other people have other ways of remembering it. It feels like I should have something else, but it, it works for me. Um, I think of the two functions as the low function and the high function. High, of course, being on top. And so then when you write out this derivative rule, you can write it out as like a little, a little rhyme, right? Which is low d high. So that's like low times the derivative of high, low d high minus high d low over low squared. And to be honest, like after you do this a couple times, you'll know the general form 
And the really critical thing is getting the right pair here. If you get the right pair here, then of course you'll remember that it's subtraction and you'll remember to flip the pair around for the second one, right? And then you got to remember that there's a bottom. But like I said, you guys will, will come up with those no problem. The rules are not that hard to remember. Um, it's applying them in the right way that's important. So let's try one. Um, let's let h of x equal x over x squared plus 2. Um, now it sort of looks like, I don't know, maybe it could be simplified somehow. Um, but it turns out there's no real easy way for us to, to make that into the nice polynomial or something that I can work with. We're sort of stuck with this as a quotient. Now, as a little aside, if it were x squared plus 2 over x, that one I can rewrite. So this one I can use algebra to divide both of those pieces by x. Um, 2 over x is going to be x to the minus 1. And then I can take the derivative of that directly. And you did, you would have done some of those if you've tried 3.1. Okay. But this is a different problem because it's got the x squared plus 2 on the bottom. So I can't do the same simplification. This one I'm really stuck with the quotient rule. Okay. And a little bit like the product rule, we'd prefer to avoid it, right? Like I don't really want to use this rule, but but when I have to, I certainly can. So this is my low function, that's my high function. So I have low d high. So the derivative of x, well, this is the nice thing. I know the derivative of x already. Minus high d low and the derivative of x squared plus 2 is 2x two plus 0, right, or just 2x. So low d high minus high d low all over the bottom function squared. There's no, I can't think of a single time where it's useful to square, to actually multiply out that denominator doesn't make it any better you're gonna it's gonna make it probably worse really um, if you can do any simplifying you'll want it in this form as it is so you can leave the denominator just something squared but we do have to simplify and try and combine the numerator right we want to make that look better because at some point we're going to be working with these kinds of, of derivatives and we need them to look better if we want to be able to work with them so it's x squared plus 2 minus 2x squared all over this x squared plus 2 squared. So 2 minus x squared all over x squared plus 2 squared. And you can factor that sort of, right, square root of 2. It, it doesn't simplify with the bottom, so I can leave it here. Okay. Questions on that? Okay. Um, let's see if this can work here. What I'm going to try and do, I'm going to give you um, maybe three problems here. And I actually haven't, let's see, I used to use something before Zoom that had an easier way of sharing the breakout rooms. But I'm, I'm going to put you into breakout rooms and Hopefully you guys can kind of work on these 
in your breakout room. So I'm hoping I can get a whiteboard set up for all of you guys um, to maybe write or type on. But if um, not, you may just have to sort of talk through your answers, which won't be ideal. I'll, I'll keep working on that if this doesn't work out quite right. Um, but here are some functions. Okay, so there are three functions. Let me see if I can. I'll, I'll put you guys in breakout rooms and we'll see how that works. Give it a try. Um, so the goal here, right, is to actually try and take the derivatives. Um, you guys can kind of talk about it a little bit. Make, I, you know, what I would encourage you to do is just kind of talk about your general strategy, like a product rule, a quotient rule, or are you gonna try and simplify it first? Um, just talk that over for a second before you, you jump into them. Um, and I'll try and pop in and out of the different breakout rooms to give you guys a little help as needed. Um, should be uh, just like 10 minutes or so. I don't oh, mind okay. trying to speak first. Um, I think what my strategy is going to be for all of these, definitely for the first one, we got to start with the product rule. Um, and then for the second one, looks like a quotient rule. Hi, how are you guys? 